Hello, and welcome to another episode of At Home with APS. I'm Mrs. K, and I am so lucky to be joined with a lot of other wonderful teachers today. We have Miss Kraft, Miss Lori, Miss Mays, and we have a very, very special guest, Miss Jacobson, who's going to share something really interesting with us at the end of the day. So let's get started. This hour is designed for second and third graders, but as always, we welcome children and adults of all ages. We're so glad that you're here with us today. This week is going to be the last week that we are focused on earth science and life science. Um, next week, we get to start a new unit. I'm excited for that as well. So let's get started today. Our word of the day is Whoa, look how big this word is. This is a huge one. I'm going to read it to you, and then you're going to say it five times. Are you ready? This word is paleontologist. All right, we're going to say it five times. Say it to the ceiling. Paleontologist. Say it to the floor. Paleontologist. Say it to the wall. Paleontologist. Say it to the other wall. Paleontologist. Say it to your TV. Paleontologist. Wow, this is a long word. Have you heard this word before? Hmm. A paleontologist is someone who studies plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. Wow. And one of the ways that paleontologists study plants and animals from so long ago is by looking at something called fossils. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. Hmm. Where have you heard that word before? Yeah, maybe in a book. Maybe your class took a field trip to the Natural History Museum. Ooh. Or maybe you watched a cool TV show and you heard the word fossils. Now, we are so lucky today because Miss Jacobson is going to show us some really fascinating fossils. And you're going to get to read about fossils with Miss Kraft. But before I turn it over to them, I want us to take one more look at this word. What was this word again? Paleontologist. Let's look at the end. Oh, I meant to break. Let's see. Let's do this. Just this part. It says ologist. Exactly. Did you know ologist is a suffix? It's a collection of letters at the end of the word that gives us some clues about its meaning. If we have a word followed by ologist, that gives us a clue that that's someone who studies a specific science or subject. So a paleontologist is someone who studies plants and animals that live a long time, lived a long time ago. What do you think a zoologist studies? Yeah, so a zoologist studies the science of living animals. Ooh, have you heard the word meteorologist? What do you think a meteorologist studies? Ooh, that's a hard one. Yeah, so a meteorologist is someone who studies the science of the atmosphere. Typically, they study weather. So maybe you watch the weatherman or weather woman on TV, and they tell you what the weather is going to be like today. They're a meteorologist. Now, I want to make sure that we have lots of time to talk about paleontologists and learn about fossils with our other teachers. So today, you're going to fill out your Freyer's model with the word paleontologist on your own. Remember, when we do this, we put our word in the middle. That word is going to be paleontologist. And then you're going to write the definition, synonyms, a creative sentence, and draw a picture. If you need a reminder on how to fill this out, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch the very first episode we did together on April 6th. All right, are you ready to be paleontologists? and study a little bit more about fossils. Hi friends, my name is Miss Mays. 
Um, I'm a second grade teacher here in Albuquerque, and my sign name for my DHH friends out there is Miss Mays. Um, my kids gave that to me because I love mustaches. So that's my sign name, and we're going to do some, we're going to work with some big words today. But first, I want to start off and wake up our body. So if you're sitting down, please stand up and let's get our feet shoulder width apart because we're going to wake up our brain, have a little brain break after the paleontologist lesson. So, and then we're going to raise our hands up and we're going to stretch. Try to touch the ceiling. Ah. Now stretch that spine, then we're going to come down and stretch it down, try to touch the floor. Ah, now you're going to stop midway, and we're going to go to the right and stretch our back this way, taking it kind of slow. Take a deep breath. And now we're going to come back to the left. And one more time. your body waking up, getting ready for some more word work. Okay, now like shake that out. Now we're going to do what I call, we're going to wake up our right brain and left brain and make them talk to each other. We're going to do the elephant trunk and we're going to make a figure eight with it so we can um, cross our midline. So we're going to do an elephant trunk like this and now we're just going to make, did you notice it's called a lazy eight, because this is an eight, but we're going to make a lazy eight It's laying down. So we're going to do it this way, and now we're going to go up and around and move our whole body, waking up our left side and our right side of our brains, saying, hello, work together. Take some deep breaths. And one more, and then... Now we're going to just take a big, big, deep breath and whoosh it out. Okay, so now are we ready to work with some really big words that when you break them down, they are two words. Do you know what that's called? Can you remember? Compound word. It's two words like pop and corn that come together to make one word. And the beauty of compound words is that most of the time, they give us a hint about what the big word means. Pop and corn. So let's think about that. Is it corn that popped? It is. So let's try some others. Let's see, what about the word birdhouse? What are the two words that make up birdhouse? Bird and house, birdhouse, right? So when you're writing it, you could write the first word, bird, and then house. And then you can think, hmm, what is a birdhouse? When you see that big word, you go, it's a house for birds. Do we have other words? Can you think of other words that are compound words? Let's try. How about the thing that your mail goes in? Do you know what that's called? How about a mail box? Do we all have a mailbox? Sometimes it's at a post office, sometimes it's on your porch, and sometimes it's out front. But they're boxes that your mail goes in. Okay, how about... Um, Oh, this is a fun one. This happened, I think it was last week. We had a little bit of snow, but it wasn't a storm. Two words, snow and storm. Bring it together and you got snowstorm. So I made a bunch of these, and you could make some like this, where you put two words and then you fold it together to make one word, doorbell, door, and then bell, doorbell. So it gives us a clue that this is a bell that's on the door, right? So I have a question, though. 
What is this word? Butter and fly. Hmm. So we put them together and we get butterfly. Now, is butterfly a fly with butter on it? So not all of compound words tell us what it is. They doesn't always give us a clue. But I did do some research where this did kind of come from, and they said that there's some theories that one theory is that they were churning butter and butterflies were flying around, and so they started calling them butterflies. So that could be a reason. Or, and another theory was that the butterflies were butter colored. But they're definitely not flies with butter on them, are they? <laughs> That's not. So my challenge to you is to find some, write as many compound words as you can in the next couple of days and find some compound words that don't give you hints of what the big word is. That the little words, when they come together, don't make, it doesn't mean the same thing. I have another one. Have you thought of one? I like it on pizza. Mushroom. Mush and room. If you put it together, mushroom. But what's mush? What does mush mean? It means like it's kind of soggy. And, so, and room is a place in a building. So is a mushroom a mushy room? No. It's a wonderful vegetable that I like on pizza, a fungi. Huh? So, um, so my challenge to you is to please, um, like I said, list all the, word, all the compound words you can find and then circle or star the ones that really don't tell you the two little words coming together doesn't give you a hint of what the big word is. Because remember, a compound word is made up of two or more smaller words that then make a big word. So I hope you enjoyed word work with Miss Mays. And we will do some more word work as the weeks come. Next up is Miss Lori, who's going to continue her writing lesson from Friday. Remember, we were writing a paragraph about um, the, the moon and orbiting and stuff. So thank you. And Miss Lori is up next. Hi, welcome back, friends and writers. I am so thrilled to be with you here today to continue our work on informational writing. And I want to say what a wonderful lesson that we got from Miss Mays on compound words. I had never thought about butterflies in that way, so that is a great thing to learn today. So friends, we are going to continue with our informational report writing. Today is really our big day. It's kind of the end. When we meet again on Wednesday, we are going to just be kind of hopefully being able to look at the work we did and that has been completed, right? Because that is the end of our unit for this time. So quickly, we're going to refresh a little bit about the things that we've talked about over the last two weeks. I'm hoping that you remember to bring your writing journal with you and that you have really started this process, that you have your first paragraph written. So let's just review really quickly. Let me see if I can find my pointer. Here's the pointer and go over this. So the informational report checklist, remember that can be found on um, the at home page on the APS website. Hopefully you've already either copied it down or printed it down. So we're not gonna go over the first um, five points. We already did that. I have added some new things that are the things that we need to get accomplished today before Wednesday. So these are the things we need to get accomplished and get checked off so that our report will be done and beautiful. So the sixth thing is that I grouped related details in my body paragraph to develop my topic. So that's what we're gonna look at here in a minute on our introductory paragraph that Miss Mays and I wrote together. I finished it up um, so that we have that done so we can look at that. And then today we're gonna hopefully talk about using linking words and phrases to connect your ideas. If we don't get to that today, we will finish that up on Wednesday. 
And then lastly, you provided a concluding statement that provides a sense of closure. This is really important. This is that last paragraph that you're going to write to really wrap up your report and let your reader know exactly what they should have learned through reading your report. So here's your checklist. Hopefully we can get these all checked off and then we'll be good to go to share our reports. So before we look at the paragraph, I want to come back to this page. This is an important page that we used to um, lay out how we wanted our report to go. My report I'm writing is on the moon. And remember, we came up with four important things that we wanted to say about our topic, the moon. And then I went and I numbered which order these four things should happen in the report. But before we could get to the report, we have to remember how to write a paragraph. So we have our graphic organizer, again, can be found on at home with APS website. And here is our graphic organizer to remind us about exactly how to build our paragraphs. We have our topic sentence, which is our introduction. Then we have our detailed sentences. I have four of them because I picked four things to talk about. And then we have our closing sentence, which is that conclusion. And then we just repeat this paragraph style over and over again until we get to our conclusion paragraph. And then we just recap, which means to restate everything that we had in our initial topic paragraph. Okay? All right. So let's look at how I did with this paragraph that Miss Mays and I wrote. And hopefully it's sticky enough that it will stay. I'm going to use some colored markers as we go through to look at if I was able to cover all the information I said I wanted to. So I'm going to take this down and move it over here. And we're going to look. So here is our opening sentence, which is our introductory sentence. The moon orbits the earth and is the brightest object in our night sky. So that was our introduction. Then I came to, well, number one, we use that as our number one. Then number two was the phases of the moon. Let's see if we remembered that. So this next sentence should be the number two on our graphic organizer. The moon has different phases which makes it look like it changes shape during the month. Okay, so what we did our work on last Friday, Miss Mays and I got that done. We got the first two sentences done. Now we're moving to sentence number three. So number three is about moon mythology and legends. So let's see if I got that on here. In ancient times, there were many stories about the moon having special powers. So there's my sentence that introduces the idea of mythology and legends. And then let's see, what color have I not used? Oh, brown. So then, that was number three. And then now I should have a sentence about the um, International Observe the Moon Day. So here is my sentence about that. Every October, there is an international observe the moon night where people all over the world celebrate the moon. Okay, so I have been able to write a sentence uh, introducing each one of the topics for my report. Then the last thing I needed to do is now I have to have my summary sentence that summarizes everything that we've written about to let the reader know that we're moving on to the next thing. So my summary sentence down here says, there are many interesting things to learn about the moon. And I put that there because then it leads the reader to wanting to know more about what there is to learn about the moon. So to finish my report, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take my paragraph graphic organizer and I'm going to start with a paragraph 
on the phases of the moon. So I'm gonna take the notes that I took, dig those out, and I'm gonna use my notes to develop a paragraph that is just about the phases of the moon. That'll be my second paragraph. Then my third paragraph, what do you think the third paragraph's gonna be about? Let's look at the chart up here. Let me move this down so you can see the whole chart. What is gonna be the third paragraph? You guys are right. The third paragraph is going to be about moon mythology and legends. So then I have to find my notes that I took around the moon mythology and legends, and I'm gonna use that information to build a totally new, different paragraph. Then my next paragraph is going to be on the International Observe the Moon Night. So that will have a paragraph just about itself, and it'll have three details that I have put in my notes specifically about Observe the Moon Night. Then my final paragraph will be a paragraph in conclusion where I will wrap up and remind the reader of the four things that we covered in my report. So I am looking so forward to you guys being able to do that. Now I'm gonna show you something really briefly about a way to help you transition from one paragraph to the next or even use in your sentences to make your sentence links different sizes. So this is called linking words and phrases chart. This will be found on our at home with APS web page. So you can pull this down to help you in your writing. So there's several different types of words that you can use in your writing to help your paper run more smoothly. So some of the ones that they have are if you want to add something like an additional item in your writing, you can use the word and, in addition, also, or, as well as. So if you want to do that, you can use a different way to say it instead of saying it the same way each time. It keeps your writing fresh. It makes your readers more interested because it's not the same thing over and over. The other categories that we have that we can use is if you want to compare something, like you can use like, just like, similarly, and same as. As I'm reading these to you, I'm thinking, hmm, earlier in our units, we've been talking to you guys about synonyms. Miss Anna, Miss Kay, she talked to us a lot about synonyms in our Freyer model. So these are kind of like synonyms. So they mean the same thing, just a different way of saying it. So we also have contrast, so you can show how things are different. Emphasis, if you want to show something and highlight it and give it more emphasis, that's kind of like the exclamation point, right? That gives more emphasis. And then if you want an example, but you don't always want to say, for example, for example, you can say, for instance, including, or such as. So that gives you some choices, which is always a good thing. And then if you want to give a reason, you can say because. But we say because a lot, so sometimes you don't want to use that word too much. So you can say due to, or since, or there. And then the last one is if you want to show a sequence of events or something happening in a certain order, then these are ways that you can do that. You can say first, you can say something happened, then something else happened, something happened first, and then the next thing that happened, and then we'll end with finally, which is the perfect word to end with finally because that is about all the time that we have for writing today. I really challenge you to write a fabulous informational report and share them. You can share them through our Twitter. So hopefully we'll get some samples of some of the write fabulous writing that you guys have done. And we will come back on Wednesday and look at Specifically, did we hit every single thing that we needed to do to make our informational reports the best? So that's great. Now, we have a fantastic treat for you up next. Ms. Kraft and Ms. Jacobson are going to talk to you about fossils, and you are going to learn so much. I'm so happy for you. Have a wonderful day. Welcome, friends. It's Mrs. Kraft. And I wanted to remind you what we talked about last week 
and then show you some of the, the amazing things I have in store for you today. So remember last week, we talked about rock collecting. Was anybody able to go out and make, collect some rocks? If you did, wonderful. If not, don't worry. They're going to be there. Remember, our rocks are at least a million years old. How about were you able to write that number, a million? How many zeros did you come up with? If you got six zeros, you're right on. Great job. So today, we want to talk about another type of rock that you can find, but a really special rock called a fossil. A fossil. I'm sure you've probably found some as you're out exploring, but we're going to do a close reading on fossils which will explain to you a little bit about the two types that we have. And then we have a special guest that is a fossil collector. And she's going to show us what she's found. All right, let's get started. Remember, when we do a close reading, we're going to read it more than once. And do you remember what we do the first time we read? If you said just reading for vocabulary and meaning, you're absolutely right. All right, so let's do our first reading on fossils. The title is about fossils. A fossil is the remains of a living thing. A fossil can be the whole part of an animal's body or just the shape or a footprint. This is a great way to learn about animals that lived a long time ago. There are two types of fossils, trace fossils and body fossils. Trace fossils are the imprint of a living thing in stone. Body fossils are the actual parts of ancient animals. <clears throat> Here's our word for Miss Anna. Paleontologists are scientists that look for both kinds of fossils. Okay, we had some hard words in there. I know you knew paleontologists because you went over that with Miss K. But let's go back. So remember, our first reading, we just sort of think about what we read. Well, we read about fossils. We learned there are two kinds of fossils. But let's dig in a little bit deeper. So remember, when you read something more than once, you get to see more than you saw the first time. Remember our cruise around the neighborhood? We saw that house that had maybe a cat sitting on the porch. And then we came back a second time and we saw some incredible, beautiful flowers they may have planted. So every time you look at something, you dig deeper and you see new things. All right, let's see what we see new in this reading. A fossil is the remains of a living thing. So think about that. So we have. We have skin and we have bones in us, don't we? And those stay. Those are going to stay. They may take a time in our earth to, to decompose. And so they're going to be there for a long time. And our fossils are there for a very long time, sometimes because they are in stone. All right, so it's a living thing, something that was breathing, right? All right, a fossil can be the whole part of an animal's body, or just the shape, or a footprint. <coughs> that you leave a lot of footprints when you run. And it can be the part of an animal's body. Have you read about the dinosaurs that they've dug up? And they can piece the bones together to create the whole animal so we can see what that looked like. Wow, OK. So you know more than you think you do about this. All right, let's keep going. This is a great way to learn about animals that lived a long time ago. 
So we're talking about ancient animals, right? Animals that lived in the past. There are two types of fossils, trace fossils and body fossils. Let's stop there. Trace. I like to trace things. Have you ever tried to trace something on a piece of paper? You're making the outline of it. That is exactly what happens when an animal is a trace fossil. You can see the outline of its body. Wow, it's pretty cool. I didn't put those two things together. And then a body fossil. So you could find fossilized, like we said, dinosaur bones. And Miss Jacobson is going to show you some other fossilized animal parts. All right, trace fossils are the imprint. Hmm, there's a, a word I haven't seen before, imprint of a living thing in stone. Have you ever used a stamp? Maybe you've made one in your class and you put it in paint and you stamp it on a piece of paper. You're making an imprint. That's exactly what happens when these animals make an imprint, right? Pressure, remember our pressure and heat with our sedimentary types of rock, it pushes it in and it makes an imprint. It's exactly right. So it makes it in stone. Body fossils are the actual parts of ancient animals. <clears throat> so the actual parts means it is a bone. It could be a leg or it could be an arm bone. Maybe it's the skull. So all of those things can be fossils. Ancient. Here's a word. What does that word mean? Can you say it into your TV? Ancient. Look at that ending, how we say that, ancient. That means old. Yeah, so old animals. Paleontologists, I know you know that, <coughs> are scientists. Oh, scientists. I take science. I love science class. We get to do experiments. We get to study things. That, a paleontologist must be a type of scientist that look for both kinds of fossils. Sounds like an exciting job. So you could be a paleontologist when you go out and you look for fossils in the, in the earth, right? When you're looking for your rocks. All right, so that was two times through. Do you remember when we do a close reading and we read a third time through? So if you have a grown up with you, I would love to have you read this close reading with them. I want you to know that it is uploaded onto our At Home with APS. And you can go there and download it. It's been translated. So you could download it and read it with your student. So if you're able to do that, wonderful. Um, and remember what we do then, we can highlight. And I know my highlighter didn't show up quite, quite right last time. So you can think about things to highlight that jump out at you. And we can use marking the text. Can you make it very simple? Maybe you have a question mark for an I wonder. Maybe a star for I noticed. And a smiley face for I like this. So let's go through and do a quick marking of our text. So a fossil is the remains of a living thing. I knew that. I'm going to star that. That's so cool. And I'm going to underline living thing because that is the important part of the sentence. A fossil can be the whole part of an animal's body or just the shape or a footprint. So it can be the whole part of an animal's body. Wow. I did not know that. So I am going to put, uh, I'm going to make that my smiley face because I like, I would love to find the whole part of an animal. So that's a great way to learn about animals that are, that lived a long time ago. There are two types of fossils, trace fossils. I might want to look into that a little bit further, so I'm going to put my question mark there, and body fossils. I want to do a little more research on that, and then I could write a paper like Miss Lori taught you. So that could be a great research paper. Trace fossils are the Imprint, remember that? Oh yeah, I've done an imprint before. I'm gonna put an exclamation point there. I love doing stamps. That's an imprint of a living thing in stone. Body fossils 
are the actual parts of ancient animals. This word ancient threw me off a little bit, so I might put a question mark there and be able to come back to that. And paleontologists, wow, that's one of my new favorite words. Paleo, and then ology as Miss Ologists, as Miss K taught you. Paleontologists are scientists that look for both kinds of fossils. I love that. I might highlight that if I had a highlighter. All right, so that's three times through. Amazing job. You probably know much more now about fossils than you did when we started. Are you excited to learn more about some fossils and to see some? We've got some special guests with us today, Miss Jacobson. So I'm going to turn the camera over to her, and I'm going to let her show you some of the treasures that she's discovered. Hi, Miss Mary. How are you? I'm doing well, Miss Jacobson. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. And boys and girls, you can't see me, but you will be able to see the fossils that I brought with me. And I was listening to your close read about fossils and um, about the difference between trace fossils and body fossils. And I have mostly body fossils here, but I do have some trace fossils. After all, I was looking at that as we were reading. I want to start by looking here at this particular one. I'm going to hold this up a little bit so that you can see it close to the camera. Let me get it here. We've learned how to zoom in a little bit better. And hopefully you can see that this is the shape of a fish. And the actual scales and the bones of the fish are in this piece of sandstone here. And so the little scales that are kind of sparkly and shiny, you can see them there. Would that be a trace fossil or a body fossil? What do you think? Huh, good question. It would be a body fossil because it's the real animal that was in this. A, a student gave this to me, and I'm not sure where it came from, but it's interesting because the fish has some interesting little legs or, or types of fins right here that um, we noticed would be different on a fish that we might see today if we went fishing in a lake here in New Mexico or, or somewhere nearby. So that would be an example of a body fossil. Um, another one that I, a couple that I brought, these two fossils, this one here and this one, these are crinoids. And a crinoid is kind of like a reedy um, plant, kind of like what we might think of as coral in the ocean or, or a freshwater type of plant that other animals might live in. And in this one, I'm going to turn it around here, you can actually see one of those funny little uh, reedy looking um, pieces right here where it, um, you can actually see it. So this is, actually has the real fossilized remains of the plant in it. Um, so this is more of a body fossil. Wow. And, and Ms. Jacobson, I'd like to stop you right there and think about, so fossils don't just have to be animals. We can find plant fossils also, which is extremely interesting and very important for us to study. It's true. And, and it can also be fossil, fossil remains of things that animals or plants leave behind. And so this next set of, of fossils that I have here, there's four of them. These are all seashells. And when we were talking about trace fossils, this one's a little difficult to see, but this must have had a seashell laying up against it at some point right here in this scooped out area. And there's little lines, kind of like the ridges on a seashell, that have left their imprint on this piece of rock. And so this is a trace fossil of a seashell. And then these other three are actually seashells themselves that have been fossilized. So the kinds of seashells that you would see that have kind of a spiral on the end, that would be one there. And then this one, you can actually see in the light, you can kind of see some ridges on this one. And then it has the spiral part toward the middle here. And then this one is actually, it has the shape of, of a clamshell. Wow. And so it's got the, where the hinge would be, there would have been another part underneath here. 
And then the front part of the shell, it has that shell shape around the front. So an animal would have left these behind after it died, and this was fossilized over time. And, boys and, and friends, I think it's really important to also note that when you find a fossil, it might not be the whole thing. It might be a piece of something, mm -hmm. and that's still a treasure, right? Remember how old these are, and they do get broken up over time. They but do. when Ms. Jacobson was out hunting, she found these pieces of animals and, and, and shells that fit together. So mm -hmm. that's cool. So be on the lookout for that. Well, you know, in New Mexico, we live in a part of the country that is very good climate for the survival of, of fossils. Very true. And so even though these, these animals and these plants and these remains may have been out there for thousands of years, in our climate, they, they're not too difficult to find. However, there are some rules about fossils. And you have to make sure that you follow those rules. If you are in a national park or in a national monument and you find fossilized material, it is against the law to take that out mm, of that area. That's so good to know. So you have to be very careful. Now, I've been very fortunate that I have some friends that live in the East Mountain part of our, of our community. And they live in an area that many thousands of years ago was underwater. And so on their property where they built their house, a lot of these types of fossils came from that area where they built their house. And so that's how I got a lot of the fossils that I have here today. But sometimes you can actually buy them. And so if we look over here at this one, this big piece right here is wow. actually a fossil that I purchased. Um, and this is two different kinds of water animals. These are called ammonites. Like, it's like a spirally type of uh, seashell that you see here, the spiral shape. And then this long piece that looks almost like a dagger of some sort, mm -hmm. that is a squid. Wow. And so there are companies that buy and sell fossils where you can add to a collection as well. And that's how I got this one. But the ammonite that's here in front, this is a trace fossil of an ammonite that we found out in the East Mountains on our friend's property. And it's got that shell spiral part just like these do here on the bigger fossil, but um, it's very rough and sandy and um, is not in perfect condition. It hasn't been polished or anything like that. So a lot of fossils just look like this. They're not the very prettiest, but they, but they have the shape and the imprint of what they were before. And friends, that's a good time when you go out and you're fossil hunting or you're rock collecting to take that bottle of water with you so you can put some water over that to see maybe if you have discovered a treasure. Mm -hmm. You might not have known that when you picked up this stone. Mm -hmm. And then the beautiful, I wish you could see it in person, but the beautiful polished um, fossils that Miss Jacobson purchased are shiny and just amazing with detail. Yeah, you can kind of see how shiny they are. Mm -hmm. If I move them in the light here in the studio, you can see them kind of glittery a little bit with the light. But my favorite fossils, though, are two that I found myself when I was walking in with my students in a stream bed. And we had been walking along in a, um, a little water area, and we found this particular guy. It looks like a gigantic bug. It does. Almost like a cockroach. Wow. This is a trilobite. And when I found him, he was totally closed up in dirt, except for oh, this wow. small little area right here was sticking out. And I saw that, and there were these little lines. And so I took a, I took a pen, and I kind of dug him up out of the ground. And the top came off, and, behind, and underneath it was this wonderfully ridged-looking creature. And when we looked it up in a fossil book, we found out that this would be called a trilobite. And this is a rather large one, although I do think that they said that there are some that are much larger than that. But then we found a little tiny one. And this is a piece of sandstone that this little guy was, when we found him, he was attached to this almost like glue, but he popped off and became his own little, 
his own little body. He is <laughs> the same looking kind of bug as this uh, larger trilobite, but he's much smaller. He is black. This one, I don't know what original color it was. Now it's kind of a rusty brown color, but it might have been any number of colors when it was living. I don't know. But in this piece of, of sandstone, there's other parts of other trilobites that are embedded in that piece of stone. So um, if I were to take a screwdriver and try to pry some of this apart, I might find, I might find some other uh, fossils in there. But I kind of like looking at this, this rock just the way it is so that I can remind myself of how it was found when it looked just like that. That's incredible. And I love that we see the large animal and then the very small one that, that also lived, right? And to be able to find those. I do want to caution you, friends, when you go out into look, you know, look for these fossils, if you're going into somewhere with water, please be sure there's a grown-up mm -hmm. or an older sibling with you so that you can be careful because it's very slippery sometimes when you're out there. It can be. It can be. And fossil hunters need to be aware of their surroundings and what they're looking mm -hmm. at. And if they're on someone else's property or sure. on public land, they have to be very aware of those things. The last bunch of fossils that I have are over here. And these are all pretty similar. These are very common. And all of them came from students that I've worked with over the years. These are pieces of petrified wood. And so these came off of trees and other woody plants that um, we may have in this part of the country. And they are fossilized pieces of wood. And this one, we're not sure exactly about. It could be a piece of wood, but somebody thought that this piece right here might be a bone. And I haven't had a paleontologist look at this, but it might be something that I want to do at some point so that we can find out just exactly what this piece is that is stuck in this large piece of rock and other fossilized material. So there's lots of really interesting kinds of things. But you can tell that this is wood, but it is now as hard as a rock and could break like a rock. If I were to hit it with something hard or drop it, it might, it might shatter. So I want to be very careful with that. Now, sometimes when you find fossils, you might even find them already polished. And this one, if you've ever been to a, a shop that collects rocks or other kinds of fossils, sometimes you'll see these polished. And this little piece right here is kind of shiny. And that is also a piece of petrified wood but it's been polished um, so that it looks kind of, I don't know, kind of silvery, kind of sharp and, mm -hmm. and shiny. Yeah, that's amazing. But these others just came right off the ground where we were walking or where students were walking, and they found them and brought them to me. And so that's how I have developed the collection that I've got. That is wonderful. I love to see this. And um, I, I love that Ms. Jacobson was able to share this with us today because there are so many different types of fossils. And what I want to challenge you to do is maybe do a little bit of research on fossils. If you have a grown-up that could help you, that would be wonderful. Um, and she mentioned some really large words in there that I think would be really interesting to look up. Ms. Jacobson had a trilobite. Those are some ancient animals that lived. And you saw the different sizes. So that would be something wonderful if you're interested in this to look up and see what the, how you spell that word and then you know, the different types that, that are available. Um, she also mentioned the, the plants that she found in the fossils. So I, I'm really, it's really interesting that it doesn't have to be a part of an animal, that those plants are so important to us. And one of the words she said was a crinoid. I believe, I'm not sure if I say, I'm saying that correctly crinite or crinoid, um, look that up too because those are some cool words that you can add to your vocabulary when you're talking and you're being a paleontologist. So some very big words that we learned today that are going to help you as you become that scientific person, right? As you're out in nature um, going through things and looking. So you had a lot of information given to you today and a lot of big words. So remember, as you're going through this, work on your close reading skills. 
you can close read with just about anything that you've done. If you have a grown-up, maybe an older brother or sister that can also help you with some close reading skills, it's really important to do that. Maybe you're reading a book right now. You could pull out a favorite paragraph that is interesting to you, but you might want to dig a little deeper because it has some awesome vocabulary in it. So think about that. Think about reading something more than once to get a deeper meaning. All right. Well, thank you, students. And I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you on Wednesday.